As we are continuing this series on the spiritual gifts, we're looking at the, the nine spiritual gifts that Paul unpacks for us that you heard Pastor Mark reading to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We are coming down the home stretch of this series, and we're going to spend the next couple of weeks talking about prophecy and then tongues and interpretation of tongues. We're going to try try being the emphasized word here. We're going to try to wrap this series up in the next two Sundays talking about prophecy and then tongues and interpretation of tongues. We're going to have a lot of ground to cover uh, to finish this thing up. We've been talking about this for several months. And, you know, one of the things that I have loved about this series so far is that as we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, God seems to have been releasing or increasing our engagement with these gifts in Life Church and around from Life Church in our community as we've been talking about it. And I mean, doesn't that just sound like God? The more you talk about the things of the kingdom of God, the more we actually get to see the kingdom of God at work in and through our lives. So we've seen people physically healed. In fact, I, I've mentioned a story about a guy that we prayed for his legs. Uh, this is now like two months ago. We prayed for his knees, and, and right there in the moment as we laid hands and prayed for him, that he actually was physically healed. And then he was uh, also going to get a, a CT scan to confirm that he was still cancer-free. And so we prayed in the name of Jesus that that CT scan would be give us a good report back. And he actually messaged me on Facebook just last week to say, the CT scan came back with good results. I do not have cancer, and my knees are still strong. Isn't that awesome? So as we talk about these things, these things are happening. So of course, as we talk about prophecy today, there would be some prophetic words. I wonder what will happen next Sunday. Um, whew, all right. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul specifically engages or encourages us to engage in these two gifts that we're going to talk about over the next two weeks. In 1 Corinthians 14, 5, you can say, you can see him write, I wish that all of you spoke in tongues. That's what we're going to talk about next week. He says, but even more that you prophesied. His desire for, he says, all of you. All of you. Look at your neighbor real quick and say, that means you. His desire is that all of us would speak in tongues, but even more that we would prophesy. Now, if you're wondering, what kind of church did I walk into today? Oh, no, we're about to get weird. Uh, the goal of my message today is to answer some questions so that we can understand what does the Bible actually say about these gifts. Because I think if you're worried that we're going to get weird, I just want you to hear me say we're aware of the weirdness, and we don't want to be weird people. We might be a little strange. We might be a little different. But I think that there's a, there's a difference between strange and different and being a weirdo. And we don't want to be a weirdo in Jesus' name and scare people away from the kingdom. And so in order to make sure that we're inviting people into the kingdom, we need to make sure we have a good understanding of what these gifts really are about. Amen? Amen. So we're not going to run away from it. We're going to lean into it. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, I want to answer three questions for you in the time I have with you today. Number one, what is prophecy? Number two, I want to talk a little bit about who can prophesy. And number three, I want to wrestle with the question, how do we or should we engage with the gift of prophecy? So let's wrestle with this first question. What in the world is prophecy? And throughout this series, we've been kind of starting off each of these messages, defining our term. And if I could give you the most basic definition of the idea of prophecy here at Life Church, we often say prophecy is simply saying what God is saying. Saying what God is saying is the foundational or most fundamental or simplest definition. Now, that could actually mean you could make an argument that reading your Bible out loud is a foundational form of prophecy. You could argue that if prophecy is saying what God is saying. But the gift of prophecy that we're talking about is not simply reading or quoting scripture. There's something else happening here when we prophesy. So you might make a distinction by saying that scripture is what God has said. It will not change. You can't add to it or take away from it and still call it holy scripture. Uh, holy scripture is uh, immutable, infallible. We rely and build our entire faith on the Holy Bible. 
That is what God has said. And he won't change what he has said, and he won't change his mind about what he has said. And if that's true, that scripture is what God has said, you might say that prophecy is what God is saying. There's a kind of a present tense right now idea about prophecy with the one vital caveat that no prophecy ever given will ever disagree with or supersede scripture. Now, we could just say that about prophecy and just I think we'd begin to be okay if we just knew how do we engage in prophecy? We'll always measure it up against scripture. We'll mention that in a few different ways throughout today. Uh, but prophecy, uh, written by uh, C. Peter Wagner, here's a good definition of prophecy, is the spiritual ability that God gives to members of the body of Christ to receive and communicate an immediate message. That's that kind of what God is saying, that right now. An immediate message of God to his people through a divinely anointed utterance. That's a pretty good definition of prophecy. You can see actually that prophecy is closely related to two other spiritual gifts that we've talked about here during this series, words of wisdom, which would be times where God gives supernatural wisdom to the believer. A good example of that is when Joseph, who was the adoptive father of Jesus, uh, when Jesus was just a young child, Joseph received a word of wisdom telling him, hey, get up out of town because they are hunting your son. You need to flee to Egypt. And that was a word of wisdom because it gave him direct wisdom, insight, and instruction from the Holy Spirit. And then we also talked about words of knowledge. These are the times when a person is given knowledge that they could not have naturally known. The Holy Spirit like downloads information for you, maybe about a circumstance or about a person or a group, and you are given a word of knowledge or a word of knowing something. Uh, this would be, for example, like when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well and they're having a conversation and he says to her, go get your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. And he goes, you, you spoke correctly because you've had five of those guys and the guy that you're living with right now, you're not married to. And she goes, oh, I perceive, sir, you must be a prophet. So we can see there that words of knowledge, words of wisdom, they function in different ways. They are linked to, we would call them sister gifts, to the gift of prophecy. Uh, so words of knowledge and wisdom are expressions of prophecy, but they're not exactly where we want to put our focus today. In fact, John Stott and Bob Hunt in their book, Position for the Gifts, they outline two needs that prophecy fulfills. This kind of begins to move us in the direction that we want to focus. They talk about how prophecy covers something called foretelling, which is speaking about events to come in the future. That, that would be foretelling. I have foreknowledge. I can, I can tell you about something that is going to happen. And then forthtelling is communicating a specific message from the heart of God. So this would be the moment where uh, Pastor Mark stood up during our worship today, and he was practicing prophecy in the vein of forthtelling. God gave him a specific message from the heart of God for us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mark was anointed to prophesy. He was given a prophetic word, and then he came up and obeyed the leading of the Holy Spirit, and he spoke prophetically to us from the heart of God so that we could hear what God was saying to us today. Now... You're beginning to get a little bit of a picture of what prophecy is. Paul adds some more clarity here. I told you we were going to dig into 1 Corinthians chapter 14 today. Let's take a look at verses 3 and 4. Uh, by the way, let me just give you a little bit of a kind of a caveat here, because what we're going to do today and the next Sunday is we're going to kind of pull out some chunks out of 1 Corinthians 14. I don't normally like to just kind of pull a, a passage of scripture out and then not show you the rest of the passage. So I do want to encourage you, go and read 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, it, it's a good chapter. Next week, we're going to look at kind of the other half of the chapter that we're not going to talk about as much today, because in this chapter, 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is talking about tongues and prophecy and how they should function in the church. So if it feels a little bit like I'm just kind of pulling pieces out. I know that's norm not normally our rhythm here, but there's a reason for that. Please go read 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, and you begin to see kind of the flow of what Paul is talking about. But back into 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, Paul says, 
The person who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and consolation. The person who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. So as we're defining what prophecy is, you can begin to see here the purpose of prophecy. In fact, Paul gives us three reasons or three purposes of prophecy. For, we, we might call this edification or strengthening is what it says in the CSB. Uh, to edify means to build something up. So, so to prophesy is meant to build up the people who make up the church. So look around you. As Mark was giving us a prophetic word today, that prophecy was meant to build you up. You're a part of the church. And so that's what that prophecy was designed to do. Exhortation, uh, which is a word which means to push or encourage forward. So when, when Mark then gives us the instruction, and he was saying, maybe there's someone that you need to go make a phone call to today, because there was that word that came through our friend Chris, and, and there's that encouragement, the, the pushing forward, go do something. The Lord would speak prophetically to us as well to push the church forward in some way so that we can either get or stay unstuck. And then Paul also says that prophecy is designed to comfort us, or uh, the word console us is often used in Scripture. Now I want to be clear here. Prophecy might not always be easy to hear. It might not, not, always, be, uh, might not always be the thing that you go, oh, thank you, Lord, immediately. I, that made me feel so lovely and wonderful, and, and, and I, I just have nothing to do but to just receive and be grateful. That, some prophecies do make you feel wonderful and good and, and immediately comfortable uh, in the kingdom. But you know that ult we're having a, a conversation about ultimate comfort when we talk about prophecy designed to move us towards comfort. Sometimes you have to do something so that you can be comforted by God, right? And so we want to we understand that, that we don't just say, well, I did, that prophecy didn't make me feel good right away. It must not have been the word of the Lord. Well, that's not what we're trying to say. That's not what Paul is saying here. So we understand that prophecy is a gift for the church. Paul also helps us to understand that prophecy is a gift for the unbeliever or those people who have not yet joined the body of Christ. So people who aren't Christians yet. Now we know that Christians receive instruction, correction, and vision through prophecy, right? But then also, Paul says non-Christians can be led into the kingdom through prophecy. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 24. Paul's talking about when the church gathers together, he says, if all of us are prophesying and some unbeliever or outsider comes in, he is convicted by all and is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart will be revealed, and as a result, he will fall face down and worship God, proclaiming God is really among you. This would be, practically speaking, if a person was here with us today, and if, this, if I'm talking about you right now, then just know that God loves you and he sees you. I'm not about to ask you to raise your hand or we're not going to call you out or anything like that. But, it, but today, how that could play out is a person came into the church and maybe they are not uh, walking in a personal relationship with Jesus. This person isn't someone we would call a Christian. And they've been really wrestling with this idea of unforgiveness. I've been so hurt. How could I ever walk with God if people do hurtful things to me? And then they hear this prophetic word, God desires for you to express forgiveness because of his love and it could be that a person would walk in and hear uh, God wants to set you free from the chains in your life and they walked in feeling far from God but so bound up and the prophetic word could be a tool of evangelism inviting people to into the kingdom of God maybe someone would come in far from God and say certainly God is in this place among these people because I walked in and they started reading my mail right and I've seen this happen of people who are far from God receive prophetic ministry or be in a, in a prophetic environment. And all of a sudden they go, oh, my goodness, God is speaking directly to me. And then that's the church's opportunity to turn to that person and say, that's because God loves you. Have you heard about Jesus? And so prophecy is to build up the church through telling us how we can grow, but also build up the church by adding people to the church through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so having gone through all of that, let's come back to a bit of a broad definition of 
prophecy. I would define prophecy like this for us today. Prophecy is a special message received from the Holy Spirit that is intended to be shared to draw people towards God and promote the growth of individuals and the entire church. That's the, the purpose of prophecy by way of a, of a definition. So prophecy can have an incredible impact on people's lives. Let me share a personal story with you about a time that prophecy had a really significant impact on my life and on my family. And, and in fact, you're sitting in very much the fruit and the result of a prophetic word that was given to my family. Back in 2011, we were talking about becoming senior pastors. My wife and I were on staff at the Highlands, this great church in Palmdale, and we had been talking to Pastor Ken Hart about some kind of next season stuff, and he knew that we were going to be leaving the staff of the church, so we were having these conversations, we were praying, we had been released to talk to just a small group of our friends, and so we had kind of gathered some people and said, I feel like we feel like God is leading us and into this next season. Pray with us about what that looks like. And we actually kind of narrowed down some of our options through some words of the Lord and some discernment practices and just kind of mapping out what our options were based on some things that our district office, we're a part of the four square denomination. We have a district supervisor. They were giving us some, hey, pray about this kind of options, right? And it came down to, we had two choices. We felt very strongly that there was an opportunity for us to plant a church in Lancaster. And then we also were given an opportunity to pray about becoming the senior pastors, Sharon and I, of a four-square church in Reseda. And so we went to the Lord and said, all right, God, we need you to give us a, a, a direction here because there's this established church in Reseda that needs some pastors and the district thinks that we would be a good fit in that community. But we also have this desire here, and so we just need some clarity, right? Somebody, if it's not us, send someone to plant a church in Lancaster, and if it's not us, send somebody to pastor that church in Reseda. But give us a word. Around the same time, a woman that Sharon and I had known just a little bit, had some connections with, you know, an acquaintance within our denomination. Her name was Beth, and she, Beth actually was praying one day and felt like God put Sharon and I on her mind. And so she asked God, what do you want me to pray for Tim and Sharon about? And she then wrote a postcard to us based on what she heard the Lord say. And so we got this postcard some days or weeks or how, I don't know however long the postal service works. Ask Larry Saltzman. Um, and so the, the mail came and we got this postcard in the mail. And interestingly enough, it was right in the height of us praying about this situation. Uh, should we plant a church in Lancaster or take this church in Reseda? And in the postcard, uh, it said, Beth writes, I was praying and the Lord put you on my mind and I felt like the Lord said to tell you, bloom where you are planted. Okay, well, I don't live in Reseda. <laughs> so if this is a word from the Lord, then I think that actually, this might actually be a key to getting the answer to our question. And so we then showed this to our friends, and like our friends do, when they respond to a prophetic word, they read it and they went, oh, that's funny. Because uh, that's, it's just like you did, you know, you kind of chuckled. And so, because it's, it's, it's life-giving to hear a prophetic word that gives you some clarity about something that you're wrestling with. And we just felt such an encouragement in that moment that as we prayed, God, is this a word from you that the Holy Spirit confirmed through multiple voices? Yes, the Lord is telling you to plant a church in Lancaster. And so we set about to plant this church. And on Mother's Day of 2011, Life Church had its very first service in Lancaster. And now, a little over a decade later, you're listening to me preach a sermon in Life Church in Lancaster because Beth Mead had a prophetic word for us and sent a postcard through the snail mail. And it came at just the right time for us to get the word that we needed to have the instruction that we were asking God to give us. So you are sitting here in a life, in the result of a life-changing prophetic word. That's awesome. Thank God for people like Beth. That's amazing. So prophecy is this gift. It, it builds up the church. It, it encourages us. It, it comforts us. It calls and directs us to specific action. 
And it is a word directly from God given through people and other various methods, which we'll talk about later on uh, towards the end of our time. Th that said, uh, another common question is the second question we want to wrestle with today. This is a common question that comes up in the conversation about prophecy is who can actually do this thing called prophecy? It's an important question if you understand the difference between the New Testament and the Old Testament. You might remember, you might be aware that in the Old Testament, there were very few prophets. In fact, there was like a handful of prophets selected for every season of, of history, throughout history. They're really, compared to how many people there have been in the Old Testament, there weren't that many prophets when we're thinking about ratios of people. And this was because in the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit would come to a person and anoint them or inspire them to have a prophetic word. And there were specific people who were of good character and calling and they could be trusted uh, so that they would speak exactly what the word of God is. And, and it was so serious under the Old Testament. There were so few people who were eligible to be prophets and they took it so seriously that if you were ever saying that you were prophesying and the thing that you prophesied didn't come to pass, they would kill you. This is the moment you go, thank God for Jesus and the new covenant. Because under the new covenant, everything changes. Everything changes. Now, under the new covenant, all Christians have access to the same Holy Spirit who would come and anoint just the handful of prophets. Now we all have access now, I, I don't want to take a ton of time to unpack this because this really is like a whole other sermon worth of conversation and content. But can I just tell you that in Joel chapter 2, that's an Old Covenant, Old Testament prophetic book. This Old Covenant prophet named Joel in chapter 2 of his book, he prophesied, after this I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. This is God giving him a word to speak directly on God's behalf to the people of Israel after this, or in the end times, or later on, I will pour out all, pour my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams. Your young men will see visions. And I will pour out my spirit on the male and the female slaves in those days. Now, we read Joel's prophecy, and then we can fast forward to the new covenant. And if you read in your Bible, after Jesus died and rose again and sent the Holy Spirit... We're in the book of Acts in chapter 2. This is a New Covenant book, a New Testament book. And the Holy Spirit is given to the church. You can read about that in Acts chapter 2, specifically in verses 1 through 4. That's the, the moment when the Holy Spirit is given to the church. And everybody starts speaking in tongues who receives the Holy Spirit. Remember tongues, we'll talk about that next week. Don't worry about that just yet. We'll talk about that next Sunday. Have I hooked you? You're going to come back next Sunday? All right. So they begin speaking in tongues. There's a big crowd of people outside, and they're like, what in the world is going on? And this guy, Peter, who was one of Jesus' apostles, his key core disciples, he stands up. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 16, he says, let me explain to you what is happening in this moment. And he says, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it says, in the last days, and you can see Peter quotes Joel's prophecy. He's taking this moment where he's saying, this is how we knew Joel was a prophet, because what he said just now happened. It just now came to pass. We just fulfilled that word. And so what is Peter saying? He's saying, as of this moment, as of today, the Holy Spirit is poured out on all flesh. The Holy Spirit is for everybody, not just for moments and for a select few. Everybody can have access to the Holy Spirit. So notice what Joel and Peter both say about who can prophesy now. Men and women, sons, daughters, masters, slaves. There is no class or gender system that qualifies people for who can and cannot receive the Holy Spirit. And therefore, there is no class or gender system that qualifies people for who can and cannot prophesy. What is the standard for who can prophesy? Are you a son or a daughter of the Most High God? And have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Let me say that to you another way. Are you a spirit-filled Christian? Have you received the fullness of the gift that God has given you through salvation and through the fullness or the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Who can prophesy? Disciples of Jesus who have received the Holy Spirit. Now, just a quick point of clarity. That doesn't mean that you are a prophet 
it means that you can prophesy. Even in the New Testament, there's a distinction between what we would call the office of the prophet and prophecy. I'm not going to take a ton of time to break all of that down. That's really another conversation and teaching as well. What is the office of the prophet? But l let me just put it to you this way. Um, everyone can teach the Bible. You can teach the Bible. You can go into Life Kids and teach the Bible. You can go into the youth room and teach the Bible. You can teach the Bible here. You can teach the Bible at work. You can teach your kids, your neighbor, your friends the Bible. You can do that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you are a teacher, right? I can teach math, like the fundamental basics of math. I can teach that. But no one would ever hire me to be a math teacher. In the same way, God can give you a gift to do the ministry of prophecy, which is to give a prophetic word. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he's given you the responsibility or the the spiritual vocation or job of being a prophet. There is a distinction. We won't take a ton of time to get into that. But the reason I'm telling you that is because I don't want you to feel like what I just said to you is all of us have to be a church prophet right now. That would be like me saying you have the ability to share the word with another person. You are now are required based on kingdom principles to go plant a church and be a pastor. Which, by the way, if you want to go plant a church and be a pastor, let me know. We'd love to partner with you. That sounds awesome. We need more good churches in the world. We would miss you very much, but we would celebrate what God is doing in your life. But just because you love Jesus and can prophesy doesn't mean that you are a prophet. Those are distinct. But you should also feel some freedom in that. Do you realize what that means is that you sitting right there where you are right now, if you love Jesus and have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God wants to speak through you prophetically to encourage, to exhort, to build up the church, to call people into relationship with God. I wonder what that means about how much God believes in you, that God would want to speak through his people prophetically today. God must think the world of you. Because not only did he send his son to die for you, but he sent his Holy Spirit so that you could be a voice of the word of God to the world. You must be pretty amazing. You must be pretty special. I think that's exactly how God feels about it. So who can prophesy? Just right where you're sitting, just say, me, I can. Yeah, look at your neighbor and say, you can prophesy. Yeah, you're not telling him you're definitely going to. I don't know. That's actually up to the Holy Spirit. So now we've wrestled with what is it and who can do it. Let's talk about what I think is probably the most important question of the day. How should we actually engage in prophecy? This is an incredibly important question because prophecy is often misused. And its misuse actually results in people just putting it out of hand completely. I think we would do well to learn from an old Latin saying uh, we'll put it up on the screen for us here. Uh, this old Latin saying means abuse does not take away use. The principle here is that just because you saw somebody use something the wrong way doesn't mean we should never use that thing the right way. Right? Just because your friend doesn't know how to drive a car doesn't mean you should give up your driver's license. Just because you've heard some wonky prophecies doesn't mean we as the people of God should reject prophecy. So if we're going to engage in prophecy, let's first remember the standard that Paul gives us. The person who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and consolation. So if you believe you have a prophetic word for someone, you can always check it against the three standards. Does it build up the church or the person I'm speaking to? Does it encourage them? Does it exhort them? Does it comfort them? Does it move them towards righteousness? Does it do what we're encouraged to do? Stir one another up to love and good works. This standard that Paul offers us, combined with the foundational requirement that no prophecy will ever disagree with Scripture, gives us an idea of how we should engage in prophecy. Right? Right? Again, notice a couple of questions that Paul never invites us to ask about prophecy. He doesn't invite us to, to ask, does this make me feel good? He also doesn't invite us to ask, did I understand it? That's an important distinction. A lot of people go, well, I can't give that prophecy. I didn't understand it. 
I'll give you an example. I don't know if you heard me when you were sharing your prophecy story. Sharon and I one time were at Life Pacific University down in San Dimas for one of their graduation events. And part of that is they invite Foursquare pastors to go and pray over graduating students. And so we were invited as Foursquare pastors to go down there. And we were praying over this one particular young lady who was graduating and going off into ministry whom I did not know at all. I'd never met this girl before in my life. And as she comes up, and her whole family, her parents, her grandparents, she's got siblings there, and they're all like emotional and crying and expecting a prophetic word from the Lord and a prayer of blessing. And as we are kind of introducing ourselves, the Lord says, tell this girl, you are a potato. I'm sorry, Lord, I'm going to have to check that with you one more time. Did you say tell her she's a potato? Yes, I said tell her she's a potato. So I prefaced this prophetic word, and I, I said, all right, I said her name. And, and, and I said, the Lord is saying it. Now, I, I'm not saying this, but the, I feel like the Lord is saying it. You're like a potato. She went, okay. I said, do potatoes mean anything to you? She's like, I mean, not really. I'll eat them. <laughs> I said, well, let's ask the Lord, what does a potato mean? So we prayed, and immediately the Lord began to then download to me an understanding of what this word, you're like a potato, actually meant. Um, and in the context, I don't know if you've ever seen a movie called Faith Like Potatoes. Uh, it's... Uh, one of those Christian movies that, you know, I don't know how you feel about Christian movies. They're great. Uh, this particular Christian movie about faith like potatoes, about a guy who feels like God has invited him to become a potato farmer. And through the course of the movie, you actually learn that potatoes grow largely underground. And if you're looking for the above ground evidence that there's that what's going on underground uh, in the potato growth underground is working, you don't really get the evidence above the ground. You just have to trust that they're growing underground. And when it's time to harvest them, you just have to kind of take a step of faith. And so the movie then says our faith in Jesus is very much like that. We don't always get to see it with our eyes, but we have to trust that God is doing something in the unseen realms. Largely a very good uh, illustration. And thank God this girl had seen that movie. <laughs> Because I then asked her, have you ever seen Faith Like Potatoes? She's like, oh, yeah, okay. And then it clicked for her. And there was this whole thing that God was doing in her life where she was feeling unseen. And there was, she was wondering if God had actually done anything in the time that she was in college. And the Lord began to use us to minister to her. No, the, the Lord actually does see you. And he's actually been growing something in you that at just the right time, there will be a harvest. And her whole family just, I mean, they, they were not sure at the moment, but there were tears and reception of this word from the Lord. And, and just for the record, I have no idea where that girl is or what she's doing. But in that moment, that was a strange word. I did not understand it, but understanding is not necessarily required for my obedience, right? That's a good lesson about how to give a prophetic word. And then Paul actually encourages us uh, to make sure that we are uh, engaging in pro prophecy in healthy ways in our church gatherings, as well as in those kind of individual moments. In fact, if, if prophecy were to happen again in this moment, we can even look back at the way that it happened earlier this morning. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 29, it's talking again about how prophecy should happen in the church. How do we engage in this? He says two or three prophets should speak. In other words, when you get together on Sunday, don't spend the whole time with every single person having to give a prophetic word. Just, you know, two or three prophets should speak. And the reason for that is you begin to find that there's a consensus in what the Holy Spirit will speak. Because it's not like God will give a prophetic word to Kyle and it'll be, you know, about potatoes. And then God gives a prophetic word to Bryce and the word is like potatoes are stupid. That's, that would be a moment where we go, I'm not sure that we're both here. And, right? I'm not sure that we're both hearing the same, the same voice. Two or three prophets should speak and the others should evaluate or test or judge the word. But if, someone, uh, but if something has been revealed to another person sitting there, the first prophet should be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one 
so that everyone may learn and everyone may be encouraged in the prophets. Spirits are subject to the prophets since God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Here's how this played out today. Pastor Mark had a prophetic word for us during that worship moment. He came up and gave that prophetic word. And then Chris, who's sitting right over here, she had a prophetic word, and she came up, and based on where I saw you out of the periphs, went all the way back around uh, around the back of the church and stood right here, let Sharon know. Sharon came up to me and said, hey, there's another word in the room, and so I'm just going to let Pastor Mark know that there's another word in the room. The three of them went over here and had a little bit of a huddle. I'm watching Pastor Danny because he's leading worship, and he's always doing this thing where he's like, even I don't know if you've ever noticed it. Don't be distracted by it now that I'm going to tell you this, uh, but he's playing guitar and he's singing and sometimes he's got his eyes closed and every now and then he just goes like this <laughs> just one eye right just one eye because he's looking either at me or he's you know so I, I'm watching Danny because I'm trying to figure out am I going to have to tell him like buddy there's something happening over here just get ready you know this is happening and Danny sees and I see that he looks over this way and then what he does is he begins to make space in the room for this other thing that's happening to come up and happen because we've got this relationship going on that we know that there's structure and order, but we want to give lots of room for what the Holy Spirit would say. But notice what Chris didn't do. Sitting right there, she didn't like bum rush the stage and be like, excuse me, Mark, I've got a word now. It's my turn. Or just begin to speak over Mark while he was up on the stage ministering a prophetic word that the Lord had given him. So Paul says... Let two or three of you prophesy. He's saying there's no problem with multiple voices. In fact, that's often helpful to the environment. Even the voice that came through a written note, helpful, two or three voices all in one day saying very similar things. Isn't that interesting that the same God would say very similar things to multiple people so that we can confirm this is, in fact, God speaking to his people. Right? So you might be tempted to go, well, why'd you read the note? That was so redundant. We already heard that twice. Ah, you heard it once through multiple voices, and praise God for that, right? But there's also meant to be structure and order. So Chris didn't go, it's my turn now. I'm speaking over Mark, and Mark is like, I'm not finished. <laughs> that would be terribly out of order, but I would love to watch the two of you get into it. <laughs> two of the nicest people that I've ever met. If something's been revealed to another person sitting there, the first prophet should be silent. And I love the way that it worked out in this moment. The word came. I would imagine that it was something like, Chris, do you feel like you need to come up? Uh, and then Pastor Mark said, well, I don't know how it worked. I wasn't in the side conversation. But then all of a sudden, Mark comes up and says there was another word that came. One at a time. Same word. Wasn't it? Then all of you can prophesy one by one so that... Everyone may learn and everyone may be encouraged. It would have been a gross misstep if there was the side huddle over here and then Mark looks at Chris after hearing this word that definitely confirms what has been said by the Holy Spirit already and builds upon it, gives us even more steps forward in our conversation about what do we do with chains and how is God breaking them. And God brings this word to narrow our focus even more to this realm of unforgiveness. And how crazy would it have been if Mark was like, thanks for sharing that with me, Chris. I feel really good now about my prophetic word. Bye, and then not shared that with the rest of the church. See, prophecy comes from multiple people so that everyone may learn and everyone may be encouraged. The word didn't come from Chris so Mark could be encouraged, but so that everyone could be encouraged. Does this make sense? So that's a, that's a good idea about how prophecy works when we are gathered. Uh, by the way, just for the record, uh, if you're in like a side moment, an individual, a personal thing, if God is doing something between just me and Kyle, and I have a prophetic word for Kyle, there's a distinction between a prophetic word that's for Kyle and a word that's for the whole church. And so we have to also know the difference when we have a prophetic word for the whole church, which is, by the way, the reason that Chris submitted the word to the leadership in the room, said, I believe this is what God is saying to the church, I'm submitting that. And there's been some times where people come to me and they go, I have a word, I, th I, I just want to check this word with you. And I, I've actually felt in that moment, like the Holy Spirit is saying, that word's actually for you. Do me a favor and go back to your seat 
and pray, is that word for me or for the whole church? And there's been most of the time those people come back and say, actually, that word was just for me. I needed to go and sit and listen to what the Lord is saying for me. And then there's been some times where a person comes and says, I actually feel like that's still a word for the whole church. And our obedience to structure and order that makes tons of room for the Holy Spirit to speak is the way that we get to engage prophecy in a healthy way. Now, I want you to pay special attention to one other thing that Paul says here as he talks about how we should engage prophecy in a healthy way. He says this phrase, the prophet's spirits are subject to the prophet's. This is one of the ways that we see a distinction between Old Testament prophecy and New Testament prophecy because the Old Testament prophet really was submitting everything of themselves to the word of the, of the Lord, to the, pro, to the prophecy, to the point that if they were to speak prophetically, they were putting their life on the line. And thank God that Jesus has died and defeated death so that when New Testament people prophesy, if and when we miss it, the death that would be required for us missing anything has already been taken care of. But here in the Old Testament where we would, would be that on the line, that submitted, Paul actually says this really interesting, subtle, and important thing. The prophet's spirits are subject to the prophets. What he's ultimately saying is I want you to understand that when you prophesy under the new covenant, you're still in control of how you say what you heard. Which also means, that's why I can tell you, speak one at a time, and if it's not your turn, be quiet. So no one can say, I don't have a choice. The Holy Spirit has possessed me to speak right now, and, and it's him speaking. That's not how the Holy Spirit works through the New Testament believer. And ultimately, I think Paul is, among other things here, warning against emotionally driven prophecy. Now, I want you to notice I'm using the quotey fingers here, emotionally driven prophecy. Because there are many times that we see that people are actually speaking from their own emotions, desires, or opinions, and then we call that a prophecy, and it turns out that was just what you thought about a thing, not what God actually said about a thing. This would be speaking our own desires and claiming that they are God's word. Can you indulge me for a moment to unpack the danger of emotionally driven prophecy? I'd like to root this uh, around this statement that prophecies given from human emotion drive people to human reaction. And what we don't want is for you to have a human reaction to what the Lord is saying. When the spirit of the Lord is speaking, it is actually the spirit of man that should first take action to respond, to receive the word of the Lord. And if it turns out that we're just speaking to you in the flesh, then your flesh will be the thing that will respond. I want to be sensitive here, but I need to be able to unpack the danger of emotionally driven prophecy so that we can understand just how much this can derail what God is actually trying to do in and through his church. Now, you all live through 2020. Praise God, we made it. We're a couple of years out. We're still feeling many of the effects of that. And let me just talk to you about a couple of ways that we saw emotionally driven prophecy that you will all remember. In the early part of 2020, this thing called COVID-19 happened. Perhaps you've heard about it. I remember when, when COVID-19 was, was in the upswing. In the early days when it was in March and, and we were closing down our public gatherings, moving the church online, we were responding in all kinds of ways. And there was a swell of people who were saying that there was a prophetic word that God has said, declared prophetically, that COVID-19 would be eradicated. I remember that word being uh, repeated quite a bit because they weren't saying it was going to be okay or we were going to make it. It was COVID-19 will be eradicated. And there, the clarity that came even there was people saying, when we use that word eradicated, we're saying COVID-19 will no longer and never again exist. And they were saying by Easter of 2020. I remember prophetic voices, people were saying, this is a prophetic word of the Lord. COVID-19 eradicated by Easter of 2020. So Easter of 2020 came and went. And you know how that happened. Now, we're 
called to measure the word, right? Here's how we know that people were speaking out of emotions, because it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Another way that you can tell that people are uh, speaking from the flesh is because when something doesn't happen, watch how the person who prophesied responds. The appropriate response would have been to stand up and say, I was speaking out of my desire, and I confess that I missed it. What I should have said is, I am desperately asking God to eradicate COVID-19. And for some reason, I keep saying Easter. God, would you do that by Easter? That would have been a great response to, to having missed it in that moment. We would all have said, oh my goodness, we're so thankful for the humility of your leadership and your prophetic voice. We can trust what you say now, next. What they did instead was they moved the goalpost. And they said, actually, um, we didn't miss it, but it was actually Easter 2021. This happened. And they doubled down and just moved the goalpost. Then, I don't know if you knew about this, but we had a presidential election that year. And there were prophetic voices. Some of the same people who said that COVID-19 would be eradicated by, 2020, by Easter of 2020 stood up and said, Donald Trump is going to be the president of the United States. Now, I am apolitical. I am not telling you my opinion about whether or not I think he should have won or not. Okay, this is not that conversation. I am only talking about the prophetic expression during that season. Okay? If you want to know my political opinions about that, I'm never going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but people stood up and they said, Donald Trump will be. God is saying, this is God's man. He will be reelected. And then that didn't happen. And then you began to watch, how do these people respond to the fact that the thing that they said God was saying didn't happen. And the concerning thing that happened was that they said, actually, the devil and the Democrats stole the election. And, and I, I want to be, I said, I'm, I'm trying to be sensitive here, but we have to talk about this. And I'm not making a political statement here, but this is his, historical this is what happened, and it didn't happen in our politics. It happened in our church. It happened even in, to some degrees in this church, not ever from this pulpit. But people got wrapped up in false prophetic words that were driven by emotion that in some ways, this wasn't the only reason that we got to January 6th, but in some ways, the result of bad prophecy, emotionally driven prophecy, drove many people, not everyone was there because of this, but many people went to Washington, D.C. and took some very concerning action. People lost their lives because they misrepresented the Holy Spirit regarding COVID-19. People did not take that thing seriously because people said, don't worry about it, it'll be gone by Easter. And people said, the devil and the Democrats stole an election. Let's do something about it. God wants us to do something about it. And when the election results came, came in, they said, God really wants us to do something. So let's be there. I remember one person who said Donald Trump would win stood up and said, you know what? He did win. And in fact, on the inauguration day, there's going to be the, the National Guard and the Army will come in and they'll make sure that Donald Trump actually does get to swear the oath for a second term, which doesn't even make political or legal sense, let alone spiritual sense. Again, I am not making a political judgment here. I, and, if, and if you got wrapped up in that, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But I do, as your pastor, owe you the love and the grace to tell you with all of the ways that it makes me nervous to talk about this in, in public. I owe it to you to tell you that that is a great example, a couple of great examples of the ways that I believe people who meant well got it wrong. And it cost us. And it is still costing us. And there are people who refuse to engage in the church because of it. There are people who have lost their faith in Jesus because we look like crazy people. Because we got so wrapped up in the flesh. And I'm using the word we 
on purpose. I didn't, but we did. The bride did that. The body of Christ did that. But just because it hurts to talk about it, just because it's uncomfortable, just because we, the sons and daughters of the Most High God, messed up, is not an excuse to push out the prophetic gift. Because I'll tell you, just as much as it was bad prophecy that got us into a mess, it has been good prophecy that got us where we are today. Because there's been prophetic words that said that, that in this season you would begin to see who the real disciples of Jesus are. And there's been a ton of people who it turned out were just here to feel good. And I mean here, I mean in all the churches, just to feel good. And there's been more clarity about who is in and who thinks that they're in than I've ever seen in my entire lifetime. It's been painful and it's been hard and in some ways scary. But just because something has been misused does not mean God wants to stop using us to do that thing. The misuse of a gift does not justify the rejection of that gift. I would just like to pause and say as your pastor, well done. We made it through one of the most awkward and uncomfortable things I've said from the pulpit in quite some time. Good job. Whew. Everybody just take a breath. <laughs> what should prophecy do? It should strengthen the church. And it should protect us from false teaching. Right? In Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to begin to wrap up. I want to give you some practical things before we uh, get you out of here today. But in, Fe in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says that if we engage the gifts in a healthy way, then the gifts will work in us until we all reach uni the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning and cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. If we want to experience the fullness of God's kingdom on earth, we must be sober-minded about the way we engage prophecy. But I would say, but we must engage prophecy. So with that, let's move towards the conclusion of, of this message. Let me give you two lists of practical things that are important for us to hear today. Here are six ways that the Holy Spirit speaks to us prophetically. Uh, not an exhaustive list, and I won't take a ton of time to get into this, but uh, these are just examples of the ways the Holy Spirit speaks to people prophetically. He gives us impressions in our mind or in our emotions. Sometimes you feel a thing or you, you think a thought. Maybe we refer to this as the still small voice. Uh, another way is he gives us a reminder of a specific scripture. He gives us dreams and visions. A dream is when you're asleep and God speaks to you, appears to you, or shows you something prophetically in a dream. And a vision is very much the same thing, but you're awake when it happens. Number four is that another person might speak to you prophetically. We heard that happen today. That can happen corporately or directly. Uh, you might even hear that in a sermon. Uh, there's been plenty of times where I have heard a sermon and I felt like the preacher was talking directly to me. Or sometimes some of you come to me and go, Pastor Tim, you were reading my mail today. That is the Holy Spirit speaking to you prophetically through a sermon. Media, uh, God can speak to you through books, music, poetry, shows, movies. I remember watching a, a movie one time that was just... I'm not, I don't even want to tell you what movie it is because I'm embarrassed that I watched this movie as a pastor. It was not a great movie, but as I was watching this movie, the Lord spoke to me through this movie that I would never tell you to watch as your pastor. So God can speak to you through all kinds of things. Just for the record, like 25% of what he said to me was, why are you watching this movie? But then he said another thing uh, that was helpful as well. Uh, and then the sixth way that God speaks to us, not... Again, not exhaustive. You might think of other nuances to this list, uh, but an audible voice. I think that this is probably rare, but there are evidences and reports of Christians throughout history, even in our modern era, who would say, I have actually heard the audible voice of God. I have never heard the audible voice of God, but I know people who say that they have, and I trust them uh, and the fruit of their ministry. So I have every reason to believe that that is still something that God does today. So prophecy can come 
by all kinds of means. That was the point of that. I, I want you to understand that it's not just Pastor Mark standing up, that there's all kinds of ways that prophecy can come into our lives. And now finally, here are six tips for how to deliver a prophetic word. Uh, these maybe are six mindsets that, or, or ways of being if you are going to deliver a prophetic word. Number one, be obedient. If God tells you to speak something and you're sitting in the middle of the sanctuary and the worship is happening, do what Chris did. She got up and she was obedient to the word. She said what God told her to say. And then obedience also isn't just say what God told you to say, but when you're done saying what God told you to say, maybe you're done talking. There's a lot of times where the Lord is like, you said what I said, and then you added your own thoughts on top of that. You could have just shut up when you were done telling what I said. But be obedient. Whatever obedience looks like for you in that moment, be that. Be clear. Say only what you heard the Lord say. But be as clear as possible. As clear as you possibly can be. You're like a potato. Can we find a way to be more clear about that? Let's pray. Uh, be as certain as possible. Before you deliver a word, check with what you know about Scripture. Does this line up? Are there any flags that, uh, and if there are no flags, then you can proceed. Be humble. Avoid arrogance. Uh, I'm not a fan of people who go around saying, Thus saith the Lord. It's just, nobody talks like that. Be humble. Be like a real person. You could, you could, you could translate that to 2022 language and say, I believe the Lord would like me to tell you. Humility will keep you from most times that you will miss it. But if you miss it, humility will save you. So you go, oops, my bad. That was just me. Be loving. Remember Paul's standard, building up, encouraging, and comforting the church. Even a correction can be delivered in a loving way. Right? Number six, be curious. I love the moments when I get to prophesy and go, does that mean anything to you? And the person goes, yeah, that. Let me tell you about why that was exactly what I needed to hear right now. Be curious. Is there anything I can pray with you about? Be curious. How can I not just say a word to you and then walk away and not care about anything that would happen as a result, but be curious? How can we journey together in the way that what God is saying to you might impact your life? So here, here's what we've learned. Prophecy is a message received from the Holy Spirit intended to draw people toward God and promote the growth of the individual and also the church. And this is a gift available to all of us, to all Christians who are spirit-filled. So what I don't want to do today, I, I don't want to end this message by saying, so now we're all going to prophesy to each other or uh, every single one of you is going to have a prophetic word given to you or that you're going to deliver before we get out of here. This isn't necessarily a, one of those messages that we're just going to hang out here until we all do the thing. But it's one of those messages that I wanted to share with you in exactly this way because I believe that God speaks to and through us, not just to and through me. And I think you believe that too. As, as, as we wrap up, I, I want to invite you to take a moment and pray talk to the Lord. And then I'm going to ask some friends to come and be available right up here and pray with you after the service. Now, if, if you come up here and you need prayer after the service, it could be, I really feel like I need to hear the Lord answer this question. Maybe you've got a question like, do I move out of town? Do I take this job? Do I date this person? Or, or what am I supposed to do with X, Y, Z? I've got all kinds of questions. I need the word of the Lord. Maybe you would come up and you'd say, I just need to hear the Lord say something to me. And, and, and that's not a guarantee that you're going to receive a prophetic word, but you will receive a loving ear and someone who will pray with you. Maybe you have questions about what is this baptism of the Holy Spirit that Tim keeps mentioning, or I am feeling so far away from God, and that conversation about breaking chains was really ministering to me, and I need to pray with somebody today. And so before we move any further, I'd just like, if you're one of those people that over the last several weeks I've asked you to come up here in the front and pray, the Smiths, uh, Kyle, uh, would you come on up? Uh, Espy, Elizabeth, would you come up? Pastor Mark, come on up. 
Uh, I just love Mark and Chris, will you come up as well? Greg and Tammy, will you guys come up as well? And we've just got a, a handful of people who are right here up in the front and available to pray with you. Arlene, will you come up as well? And so again, these people are here to pray with you, to talk with you, to listen with you, to love you today. In just a moment, we're going to pray a prayer together. That's been one of our practices during this series, to pray a prayer together. It'll be up on the screen for you in just a second. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet and pray. But before you do that, take a moment right where you're sitting. I'm going to give you just a moment. Take a moment. Was there something that the Lord said to you today that you need to respond to? Before you move, before we pray together, before you say or do anything else, is the Lord inviting you into something? Do you have a question for him today? God, I didn't understand that. God, I feel corrected in a way. Thank you for your correction. I feel encouraged. Thank you for seeing and encouraging me today. God, I need to repent of. God, I'm grateful for. God, would you give me an answer about. And God, as we bring our needs questions, our thoughts, our response, our repentance to you today. We thank you that you are a good and a loving God who meets us in the places where we are. Would you begin to speak to each of us prophetically? Whether that prophetic word comes directly to us to answer our question or through a friend, or through a sermon, or through a book, or through a group of people, or through prayer. God, would you speak to us? We thank you, Lord, that your word says that as we draw near to you, that you draw near to us. And so we come with our questions and our prayer requests and our, our challenges and even our repentance. We come with all of that trusting that you draw near to us with no condemnation, with all love, and with a word, with instruction, with comfort, with wisdom. Speak to us, God. Can you just, before we do anything else, we're going to stand in just a second, but can we respond to that moment by simply saying to the Lord right where you're at, God, would you speak to me? God, would you speak to me? God, we also ask that as you speak to us, that you would speak through your people. Use this church, the people who make up Life Church, to be a blessing of the voice of the love of God to this community. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift of prophecy. Thank you, Lord. If you're able, would you please stand as we wrap up this time? When we say amen to this prayer, you'll be dismissed. You're welcome to come and receive prayer with some of our friends up here in the front. You're welcome to go and talk and pray with each other. We love you so much. Let's pray this prayer together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for your love and for the gifts you pour out on your church. As we pursue the fullness of your presence and power, use us to be a gift to each other and also to those outside of your church. Be honored in and through our lives. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.